Uh, okay, um, so thanks everybody for, for, for joining in today um, uh, in the next uh, rounds of uh, the NF Core Regulatory um, uh, Special Interest Group. We have today our very first speaker, uh, speakers actually, as I just learned. So Jonathan and Tiani are, uh, are going to present today about uh, biocompute projects, biocompute objects. And um, we've uh, had interactions from the NF Core community with them already during some workshops, I believe, like a couple of months ago. And um, Phil Ewells, who's also quite active in the NF Core community, uh, nicely pointed out that we could invite them to actually give a presentation on what, what that actually is, about the scope of the project and what it can actually do and what is currently uh, the status of the project. And with that, I would like to invite Jonathan to start with the presentation and share his slides. And OK, and then um, I'll head over to you. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for being here. Thank you for presenting. And uh, have a go. Thank you. OK, sounds great. Um, and, and thank you uh, very much for, for the invitation to, uh, to come talk. This, this sounds like a really exciting group, and I'm very curious to see um, you know, how it goes and, and the conversations that are had. So I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to participate. Uh, my name is Jonathan Keeney. I'm a research assistant professor at George Washington University and a co-PI uh, on this project, which is funded by FDA and others. Um, Tiani Wong is also with me. She's been with the project for, I think, a couple of years now. She can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, she's um, really fantastic. She's helping to lead the current pilot project. And so she'll say a few words about that at the end. So <clears throat> uh, the punchline for biocompute is that it's a descriptive standard for computational pipelines and it, it can be used uh, to support uh, decision-making. And so there's, uh, there's a couple of different groups that kind of wanted a couple of different things uh, in the creation of this. So I'll explain the origin story to kind of explain how we got here. Uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the current and future projects around that, um, specifically related to regulatory, because that's relevant to this group, uh, regulatory work. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Tiani, who will talk um, very briefly about our, our current ongoing pilot project. And then, as I said, we've got some, some time at the end for Q&A, but please feel free to, to ask me some questions as we're going, if, if you would like to. Okay. Um, and so just to double check, you're just seeing the slides here, I suppose, right? Everything's okay. Okay. Okay, great. Um, all right. So the roots for this project go back to, to 2012 when um, United States NCBI was trying to figure out a data model for uh, an enormous amount of data. And so this is what would ultimately become known as the bio project. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to uh, represent and organize all of this data that's very different but very related and so they came up with this this nice model here based on the figure that they published um and during the planning meetings it, it was proposed that wouldn't it be really great if we could also capture all the rich metadata about the the process uh, in a way that's computable uh, meaning structured fields with predetermined data types and so forth so we could compute on it um, which was an interesting idea but still a little too nebulous at the time to be incorporated um, uh, so the problem statement had not yet really been articulated very well, but the seed was planted. So it kind of started the ball rolling on everyone talking about this issue. And, and the issue was, um, the, as with wet lab science, you can't just sort of give a figure and that's the end of it and build a repository just based on the figures. There need to be some, some provenance that comes with it. Um, so in the example of a, a wet lab image, what's the strain of the animal? You know, what cells are you looking at? What's the antibody? What were you trying to do? You know, to just provide a little bit of context for it. Um, that kind of a thing. Uh, so that you've got some, some provenance for any given assertion that ends up in that particular knowledge base. And so it was hoped that there would be some way of recording how all of the data in a data repository or academic paper or regulatory review was generated instead of one line that says X software was used. As, as was commonly done, because that's just not enough information to make a regulatory decision with. And so on the regulatory side, that feeling was much, much more concrete. Um, so this is now different from NCBI. Typically what happens, in fact, I'm told almost always what happens is that when an industry sponsor submits something to the FDA, the reviewers have to kick it back with need for clarification if there's a computational component to it. 
Uh, so the industry sponsor then has to figure out what wasn't clear and resubmit it. Maybe that's enough to address their questions. Maybe it isn't. Sometimes they'll go around multiple times. And this will draw the process out sometimes by months, and it will take, I mean, easily millions of dollars. And this is all just to get the FDA enough information to make a decision. So it's it's very, very inefficient. And I think there was starting to be some frustration on both sides. You know, let's just agree on, on some way of what do you need and how do you need it? Mm -hmm. And one very potent example of that, there's probably many of these, but one um, that at least came to our attention in, in a regulatory submission when reviewers did indeed kick it back for clarification, the sponsor had to respond and say, we don't know. The postdoc that ran that analysis left eight months ago. And that's despite the fact that it was perfectly re-executable. You know, it's just that nobody in the in in that organization understood the pipeline well enough to be able to uh, explain it and answer questions about it and so forth. And that was that was a shame. You know, they they were not able to capitalize on that work. Um, and that that may not be uncommon. You know, you might have one person or a small team that really understands some particular analysis and they poured so much time into it and it's kind of risky to have all that information locked up in, in, in tribal knowledge without a, a better way of documenting it. Um, so, so essentially a lab notebook for, for bioinformatics, just some way of documenting what you tried, what the purpose of this experiment is, the details, the context, et cetera, so that you can give an outside person some insight into what's going on. And so one solution at the time was, was just to publish a recommendation. So this is an example from a reviewer at CDER uh, that's one of the centers at, at FDA, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. So he, he just started publishing his own. It's, it's not official guidance, but it's just his personal recommendations based on his experience. So if you're in this case, next generation sequencing data, if you're going to submit NGS data, here's how I recommend you do it. It was just built, built on his own trial and error. So anytime they encountered something else, he could go back and revise that document. But it was a really great step in the right direction. Unfortunately, it was not standardized across the agency, but it was still, you know, an attempt at sort of saying, here's here's what I'm expecting and here's how I would like it. So in 2014, what was then known as the genomics working group at the FDA convened to try and tackle this issue and say, let's let's all agree on on, on something. And so the, the result of that special session is summarized here. This was an internal document, but the, the four main points were that any solution should be human readable, kind of like a GenBank sequence record, uh, machine readable so that you can compute on all of those values. It should contain enough information to understand the computational pipeline and interpret uh, that information and then maintain records and reproduce experiments. So this is kind of the core concept. And then lastly, it should be immutable. And so that idea that was originally proposed back at NCBI in 2012, and which by now is being called biocompute, was proposed to the FDA and it was accepted. And so off they went. There was uh, a couple rounds of funding, um, a few publications, two of which are annotated on this timeline, uh, several workshops, lots and lots of collaboration and testing. Um, I, all told, there was dozens of organizations, some of which are on this slide. Uh, most of the private sector ones are not, but some of the many of them are. Uh, I think we had hundreds of people by the time. Uh, it, it finally was standardized that had in some way kind of touched the standard and, and made their voices heard. And so the basic idea was that we wanted something that was flexible enough to support any pipeline, but rigid enough to provide some sort of computable structure for the metadata. So we're, we're not like mandating how a computational pipeline is carried out, but we are providing a little bit of framework for how you're going to communicate it. And we can kind of improve communication between these two groups. And then ideally something that's not overly burdensome because the, you know, the idea here is to speed up communication after all. So um, we would like for it to be e as easy to use as possible. And so the model that we ended up with after input from all those hundreds of folks is categorized into these conceptually related groups called domain. So there's eight top level domains, five of them are required, three of them are optional. And an instance of a workflow that conforms to this specification is called a biocompute object or a BCO. <clears throat> and so BCOs have very strong data provenance, uh, user attribution, and descriptive metadata. So now using a BCO, you can kind of annotate your workflow and provide appropriate rationale if necessary. So um, the idea here is that a minimal BCO is, is very, very straightforward. So um, describe the inputs and outputs, describe the data transformation steps, 
um, describe the environment that you ran it in, who is the person that ran the analysis, and explain what you're trying to do and give some context, kind of like an abstract. So it's a very straightforward model that lets you annotate your workflow with descriptive metadata and provides computable structure for all that metadata. But it has the structure for a lot more detail. So for example, if you want to connect to other namespaces and other identifiers, uh, or you can use JSON pointers to uh, point to specific rows and tables, for example, um, you can do either of those things. <clears throat> Um, it's also very extensible, so I, <clears throat> I didn't really go through these domains, but the very last one here is the extension domain. So this is a user-defined domain. As long as you provide your own schema, you can essentially extend this out to whatever, you know, internal or external schema that you would like to. So it's, it's also uh, highly extensible. And our, our main way of pointing uh, it to data is the URI, which is very flexible. Um, it can be... Uh, a specific entry in a namespace or a good old fashioned URL or a local file path, you know, all of these are just fine in, in the URI schema. Uh, and, and so related to that, to be clear, no data is on board with a BCO. A BCO is more like a manifest. So it points to the specific files, um, meaning actual access to the data is a separate issue. So it kind of separated the BCO manifest from the data. Um, so these let you point to your resources, like a particular version of the human uh, genome HG38, for example, I think is maybe that second one, uh, or the most updated telomere to telomere reference um, in the next line. So it gives you uh, a way to point very explicitly to your resources in a way that conforms to the specification. And so at the very beginning of 2020, it was finally standardized as IEEE 2791-2020, which is now the official name of it but we still keep calling it biocompute because that's a mouthful and biocompute is much easier to say. So that's what we'll keep calling it. it, it because it's IEEE, it was published, you know, it's, it's the actual standard is paywalled, but the schema files are in an open access repository. Uh, and the, the URL to that's here, I can make these slides available or you can just refer to the recording here. Um, but uh, if, if you do go take a look, this this object that I've got in red here, 2791object.json, is the top level object that you would start with. And this will refer you out to all of the references that you need. So this is where all the definitions are for all of those, uh, all those domains that I mentioned. And within months of standardization, it was accepted by three different FDA centers for almost all applications. There's one renewal application that is not really relevant for it, but, but all the other ones you know, any, any application that it's relevant for, it's it's been accepted for. So that's kind of light speed, you know, for the FDA to um, not only uh, accept and support a new standard, but also publish, uh, you know, in the Federal Register about that, you know, within months of it being standardized is, is very, very fast. And so they're really hoping to get more of these. Uh, unfortunately, there, there has not been uh, enough coming in in the form of BCO. And when I recently spoke with one of the FDA, um, I guess assistant directors about it, he said it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario. Uh, he said FDA doesn't want to mandate something without giving industry a chance to try it out and comment and so forth. But industry doesn't want to do anything unless um, they're told by the FDA to do it, because that's going to take more time and resources for them. And so it's kind of in this tricky spot right now. Uh, and so they're, they're currently working on some guidance, which has been in development for a while now. Uh, it won't be published this year because they hate publishing any guidances during an election year. So I would expect early 2025 most likely, but basically I think they feel like they're just not getting enough BCOs in regulatory submissions to you know really test it out and make sure that it's working the way that everybody on both sides wants it to work and, and kind of smooth out any, any issues with it. Um, and so some people have even started using language like, how do we make this required? I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. I think this guidance is going to be more like a call to action, um, probably getting more people to submit BCOs is, is my feeling. Um, so we'll, we'll wait and see what the final version looks like, but there's clearly interest on the FDA side to get more of these in the door. And so we'll talk a little bit more about our pilot project to kind of help with that process and kind of get people on both sides used to the whole BCO submission process at the end of the talk. 
So um, <clears throat> after it was accepted by uh, FDA, uh, our focus kind of shifted to building out the ecosystem so that there are actually tools to work with a standard uh, as well as outreach events and documentation and things like that. Uh, so we're still doing uh, some of those uh, those workshops. The keynote for this year's event was given by CBER director Peter Marks, uh, and there was other very notable figures there as well, uh, and lots of participation from the private sector too. <clears throat> so talking about our ecosystem, I would be remiss not to um, mention the NextFlow plugin, which I will do very briefly. Um, this is thanks to Ben Sherman at Sakara, and this is really, really neat. So you just enable this in your config file and, uh, and give it the path and it'll generate a BCO for you um, for free, as Ben says. <clears throat> so you'll get most of the heavy lifting done by the NextFlow engine, um, which is represented step number two up there at the top. And this is not just for NF core uh, workflows. This is any NextFlow uh, workflow. <clears throat> so you enable it. Um, and then this plugin just listens for workflow events that happen during a workflow's lifetime some task is executed and completed, um, some output file is published, uh, runtime metadata, et cetera. So it collects all this, it renders the BCO, and it will give you the overwhelming majority of a BCO, and then you can um, manually uh, curate and, and, and annotate that if, uh, if necessary. Um, but this will take away um, a lot of the effort and, and do most of the heavy lifting for you. So this is a really, really great tool, and, and big thanks to Ben Sherman for that. Um, so this is our biocompute portal. This is the place where you can upload your BCO to do further annotation if, if you would like to. You can also just you know open it up in a text editor and take a look that way. Um, but uh, but we've got a, a form-based tool for creating BCOs manually if you'd like, which might not be a bad idea for your first time just to get a feel for how that information is structured. Um, we've also got a lot of other tools here. We've got a database of BCOs. <clears throat> excuse me, the, the BCODB, which we have also deployed uh, behind the FDA firewall. So they have an instance of it. Ours is a couple of versions ahead of theirs, um, but it's it's up and running at the FDA, which they're currently testing out. Um, all the code for that is freely available on GitHub. Um, I think technically it's, it's fine. Um, I would imagine administratively, it will still be a little bit of time before this is used in, at least in the regulatory side, it'll probably be used on the scientific side um, relatively soon. Um, but, you know, as I said, the, the code for the, the DB is, is freely available. <clears throat> you can also stand up the code uh, because it's freely available in your own institution and kind of get a feel for how it works. We've got a, a prefix system uh, which I, I guess I did not put a slide in here for, but we've got a prefix system um, so you can have kind of fine-grained control over uh, not just users, but groups of users based on that prefix. So, you know, if it's a GWU prefix, for example, versus a, a CBER prefix, um, you know, you can control who can see these draft PCOs and who can publish them and delete them and share them and um, submit them and so forth. <clears throat> So um, there's other tools here too. We have um, an API for programmatically working with BCOs. You can find some documentation for that uh, as well as other things. Um, there's links to outside resources like the official standard, uh, a wiki, an FAQ, a few ways to contact us. So this is kind of our, our central hub for everything that you need. Uh, it's biocomputeobject.org. <clears throat> so we have a couple of ways to view BCOs and we're trying to expand this. Um, I think our, our focus is going to be kind of improving user experience a little bit, so to speak, in the future. Um, this is going to be based on feedback from FDA reviewers, since they're primarily the ones that will be reading these BCO reports. But, you know, we very much welcome feedback from anyone if you've got ideas for improving the ways that we represent this data. Um, some other things that FDA reviewers have asked for, this is a, a comparator. Uh, so apparently when they ask for changes to be made, <clears throat> it's difficult for them to go in and see if those changes were made satisfactor satisfactorily. Uh, and so now that we've got structured data, it should be easy to go in and just kind of do a fancy diff on the files and see what was changed. Um, so this is a mock-up of what that might look like. Uh, we have to assume that they're two very similar pipelines. So it's a very specific use case, but apparently one that really does come up and that there's a need for 
Uh, reviewers have also asked for a small executable uh, that can point to that they can point to industry sponsors. Apparently, the majority of their submissions come from very small groups with no dedicated bioinformatics person, and they feel more comfortable just using a plain old fashioned uh, executable on their local machine. Um, so that's easy enough. We'll uh, probably deploy a standalone executable version of the BCO editor in the future. Uh, that will also most likely just be available for free on the um, in the repository. Uh, we've also got a pilot project underway that's that's currently ongoing. That's in its first phase, so that we can partner with both FDA reviewers and private in industry to do some dry runs uh, with BCOs and figure out conceptual and logistical issues. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Tiani Wong to do to talk a little bit more about that. But before I do, let me just quickly thank some people. Um, I cannot thank all of the hundreds of folks that contributed properly, but a few folks that need to be acknowledged are uh, Raja Mazumder and Bahan Simonyan. They were the two original architects that came up with this idea uh, back at NCBI and worked so hard to articulate it. And I think the reason why the whole project got so much momentum. Uh, ben Sherman and Phil Ewells at uh, Sakara. That's been a really fantastic partnership and, and we we really appreciate the, the Nextflow plugin. Uh, our own GW team, Hadley King's the technical lead, Tiani, you'll hear from in just a minute. Our FDA colleagues, especially Mark Walderhog and Luis Santana Quintero uh, and the Biocompute Regulatory Advisory Board who gave us some really, really important input. And then of course our funding uh, from NIH and FDA and my contacts here, feel free to contact me as well. So um, I'll turn it over to Tiani. Tiani, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Take it away. All right, cool. Thank you, Jonathan. So I will be giving a very brief overview of the pilot project that, that's going on. Um, as Jonathan has mentioned, the biocompute was developed to reduce organizational communication burden between especially the FDA and the industries. So the pilot project that was carried out involves three parties, the biocompute team, which is us, the GW team, uh, and then the FDA, and then the industry sponsors. So the ultimate goal of this pilot project is to increase the adoption of biocompute and also bring awareness within and outside of the FDA. So um, for this initial pilot project we're running, we're working with CBER and CEDAR, um, who are, um, those are the folks who are experts on ECTD, uh, which is the required submission format for CBER and CEDAR. And also we're working with three different pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we've had individual meetings with each sponsor to understand their goal and their needs. Uh, we've also had joint meetings with the sponsor and the FDA reviewers who can help with answering submission questions and also provide guidance on the best practices for submitting BCOs to CBER and CEDAR. So based on these meetings, um, everyone has come to an agreement that the scope of the initial pilot will be on understanding the submission logistics and we're hoping to finish this initial pilot by end of this year. And then in this process, all industry participants are responsible for preparing and submitting a computational workflow with the BCO to the FDA through the test sample submission gateway via the ESG system, which is the electronic submission gateway from the FDA. And then the GW team, so the biocompute team will assist during the BCO preparation phase and also review BCOs before submission. And then once the BCO is submitted to the FDA, the FDA folks will take over from that point and test out the BCO retrieval process and then review the BCOs with minimum um, training and support, and then see if they have any questions or any issues with reviewing it. Um, so all parties will provide feedback, suggestions um, throughout the entire pilot project. Uh, and then the biocompute team will document any difficulties or barriers to work with BCOs or reading BCOs and any other just general issues. And then in addition to that, um, groups that participate in the pilot project will also have the first-hand knowledge of uh, submitting computational analysis and how to work with the standards of biocompute uh, more effectively and more efficiently. Um, um, Jonathan, can you go to the next page, please? Uh, next, yeah, thank you. Um, so we have a wiki page uh, of the pilot project. We have pretty much all the information on there. We also have an estimated timeline on there of the initial um, pilot project um, phase. 
Um, and then uh, we also have an FAQ page where we have, we host all the questions about biocompute, like general questions or how to use biocompute. And also we have a section of how to submit BCOs to the FDA. So this part, this section is related to the pilot project. Uh, it's being uh, frequently updated with all the questions that have been brought up. Um, and then we cover questions such as where the BCOs can be included in the ECTD submission, um, how to submit uh, input output files, how to submit large input output files, there's a difference. And then what are the minimum requirements for the pilot submissions and many other things. Um, and then by the end of this initial phase, we're hoping to have a paper written by the end of um, maybe this year or early next year to describe the, the entire process and also the difficulties, barriers we've faced and, and then the potential solutions for those. So that's just a brief overview of the pilot project. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and then thank you. I'll hand the stage over to Jonathan. Yeah, and so the a major focus of that paper is gonna be kind of like lessons learned and best practices and things like that. So it'll, it, it'll include conceptual content, like um, if I've got a whole cluster of pipelines that I'm running, but they're all related, would you like for these to be represented as like one monolithic BCO or each of their own BCOs? And this is, you know, something that we can't weigh in on. We need to get input from FDA reviewers. Logistically, how do these come in? You know, these kinds of things. Um, so I think that uh, all of our collected knowledge through this experience is going to be very helpful. And then we anticipate a much bigger kind of expanded pilot uh, project in the future, possibly multiple ones, um, after we just kind of get this initial experience through. Um, I would imagine maybe um, kind of mid 2025, we might be able to start get going with that, but that's that's just an estimate off the top of my head right now. So don't hold me to that. Um, so so yeah, that was that was a, a very nice explanation of the pilot project. Thank you very much, Tiani, and, and thanks to everyone for your attention. And we're both happy to, to answer questions now. Oh, and I see there I is. Care. There are two already, and maybe Weston can actually uh, bring them up because they're both from him. Okay. Uh, yes, the, the first was the, the comparator tool. Is that part of the IE, the IEEE standard or is it just sort of a, a separate add-on? Is it, is it incorporated into the standard? That's, that's a, a great question because it, it was not originally scoped to be in there. And the reason is because um, I think we're sort of myopically focused on our ecosystem and we've already got validator tools built for validating against the standard. Um, and so frankly, it hadn't really occurred to me to include a validator that conforms to the standard to be built into that comparator. But I think it's a fantastic idea because, you know, we'll probably want to package this comparator as its own sort of standalone thing. And it would be nice for, for it to also include the ability to validate against the standard. So I, I, it does not currently, to answer your question, but I think it's a, a fantastic idea. And given that we have not yet started building it, that we'll, we'll want to add that to the scope. I think it's a great idea. Uh, then the other question, similar, uh, but is the IEEE standard harmonized with how the pipelines might actually be utilized, either a clinical study tool uh, like a biomarker, so 21 CFR 11, or at perhaps a medical device, so harmonized with 1345? Not those two, to my knowledge. We had representatives from um, HL7 Fire, uh, so we did have a little bit of input from them. It's, the, it's not mentioned explicitly that we've got like a direct connection with them. Um, also had a representative from all of us, so you know, their, their perspectives were represented in the building of the standard, but there's not an explicit connection to them. Um, there's also, it's it's currently being um, sort of harmonized with lots of other standards uh, through a big ARPA-H project, including CDISC and, and many others. Um, I'm not aware of those, those two. Um, that doesn't mean that it isn't because we've got some other folks that are experts in some other standards, but th those two are not on my radar. So I think the answer to that is no. Fantastic. All right. Anybody else who has a question already would like to ask something? I will very quickly just mention, though, that one of the original, I mentioned that there, um, there was a lot of different groups that want a lot of different things from it. 
Um, I will just very quickly mention that one of the one of the reasons for biocompute was to harmonize across lots of standards, and they even use this idea of like the Tower of Babel with different people just not speaking the same language. So even though it's not explicitly um, harmonized with those those particular ones, I don't think it's going to be a heavy lift to harmonize it with those. Um, so just to kind of add on to that. Sorry, go ahead. Um, sorry, I, I have a question. Um, because the, um, the project seems to be focused on the FDA, is there anything uh, going on towards uh, regulation in, in Europe? Yeah, really good question. So we, we had contact with, uh, I think, the deputy director of the NA way back during the planning, um, but that person is no longer there. And um, I don't, at the moment, have any good connections with folks at ENA. Um, we really, really would like to kind of kickstart that, that connection again and, and get that going. Um, because we did have some really nice input from um, from our, our, our European counterparts. Um, but at the moment, unfortunately, we don't. Uh, so, you know, I think um, if, if there are folks in the European ecosystem that are interested in, in kind of seeing uh, some joint effort happen at the ENA that would like to have a conversation with us, we'd, we'd be very open to doing that. I, as I said, we'd really like to get that conversation going again. It's just that our our contact there is no longer no longer the deputy director also you have to maybe as a side note on that one um also you have to be um aware that there are certain regulatory aspects and regulation um, laws are quite different in, in europe compared to the us so there might be certain overlaps definitely i think there's substantial overlap even but in terms of what standards apply and how these are interpreted, th these are maybe also points where there will be some diversion. Not saying it's not possible to have a single standard for everybody that works for both and has a bit of a flex flex involved that could be applicable for FDA and email. But uh, in the end, um, that is probably also not something that is super easy to tackle in the beginning. Large it's overlaps might be might be true and might work well, but in, in other cases, I would say it's probably also not super easy because there are okay. some specific, specific parts in, in, in European laws compared to the US laws that are um, uh, that are applicable that might make a certain quite fine-grained points very difficult to tackle. But I mean, I might be wrong. I'm, I'm happy to be wrong actually on that one. I, I would love a standard that covers everything or at least provides yeah. interfaces to cover multiple uh, regulatory uh, authorities. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I will say that there are there are many things that we kind of had as our ideal BCO that we included as optional. Um, mm -hmm. Probably for those reasons, I mean, we did have some good representation, as I mentioned, from several folks um, on the European side. Um, I, I can't say explicitly that that's what they had in mind during the process but I, I i would imagine that was a big part of it so um that's that's really great to know thank you for bringing that up and uh yeah hopefully we can um start having those conversations again and figure out what is different and, and if um there's a if it is possible to have one standard like that to kind of har harmonize it would just make it easier on, on groups that want to submit to both um, one question going a bit in that direction, actually. I mean, I've seen that you, you have the schema now in, 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 in a standard at, at IEEE as well. And what is the process required if you, for example, want to update that? I mean, there's potentially things change over time. In the, I mean, the standard was approved in 2020, if I understood it, but um, that might also, it might also happen that at some point, for example, FDA puts out new guidance for certain aspects of how data should be handled in the future. Let's say new methods come out, new methodologies come out. People might identify, okay, it would be nice to add new things to the standard. How would the process to, to actually taking that to version 1.1, for example, um, look like? Is there anything like that already planned in, basically? Do you have a standardized way of doing that in the future, or how would that look like? Yeah, we, we would. There's a couple of like minor revisions that we've come up with. We've got a, a very short list of things that are kind of nice to have for whenever we do version it. 
Um, I don't think a version, a new version is going to happen until, you know, as you say, there's going to be like some, some major thing like the FDA publishes new guidance or something like that. Um, there is a process, you know, I, I, IEEE as a standard setting organization has a whole kind of process that you have to go through. Um, so we, we would have to form the working group. The working group has to be comprised of, you know, a, a plurality of, of different representation and no, no major representation from any one group. Uh, you have to have a certain number of folks. Every meeting has to have certain quorum and so on. So these standard developing development organizations or SEOs as they're called have, you know, fairly stringent criteria for setting a standard, which is what the FDA looks for when you're, you're setting a standard. Um, so that's, that's what gave them confidence in it. So we, we would have to go through all of that. We'd have to reconvene a working group, um, get enough interest, draft the specification, vote on it, make changes, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then we could finally publish a new version. Uh, so that's, that's typically how that goes. Um, there, there's not currently one planned at the moment. Um, as I say, the, the, the couple of things that we've identified, um, are very small. They're sort of nice to haves. And frankly, they're, they're mostly useful in the academic side of things where we use them anyway. So I don't know that there's going to be much of a demand on the, on the pharma side. That said, once we go through these pilot projects and we learn a lot about the process, it may turn out that there is something that we all want to change about it, in which case, yeah, we'll, we'll go through that process. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another one that I uh, also had up on my list, if nobody else has a question at the moment, um, what do you think would help you in improving the uptake of the standard by pharmaceutical companies, but also others? What I mean, you already said that you are having kind of regular workshops, things like that planned, um, but but are there other things that you're considering at the moment to also improve advertisement, say, let's say for the standard, um, to, to work on the pilot projects also in the future, maybe, or future projects on that level? What, what is your take on that? Do you plan to advance that a bit more or, or even advertise it more so that more people are chiming in or what's your take on it? Yeah. Uh, this is great because I'd love to hear the opinion of anyone who um, has thoughts on this, but uh, I think that has been a little bit of a learning process for me because a lot of what we've done is like sort of academic conferences and papers and, you know, some, some workshops at the FDA, but have realized, you know, maybe in the last year and a half or so that that's maybe not the best approach to, to getting the word out in private sector pharma. So we're, we're kind of expanding, uh, our, our strategy here. So we're doing things like the Fuse conference, which was recently brought to our attention. We'll, we'll, we'll give a talk there, you know, talks just like this. Uh, the next flow, um, next flow summit, which we presented at um, the, the most recent one in Boston. Um, so this is a major part of what we're doing to kind of help just get the word out and make people aware of it and uh, where it came from and why it exists and, and, and the fact that it can help. The pilot project is is another thing that we're doing. And then of course, you know, kind of working with FDA around maybe getting some guidance out. Um, hopefully they'll publish some guidance around this in the near future. Uh, that's our current strategy. Um, we are very, very open to hearing, you know, how you being in, in private sector industry, how would this get on your radar? Do you have any other ideas? Um, we're, we're very open to, to hearing about that because we're, you know, solidly in the academic setting and so we know how things get onto our radar here um so if you if you've got any other thoughts besides the ones that i've just mentioned we we'd really love to hear it either now or you can send an email later yeah kim um yeah i had a question so i i think one of the exciting things to about the biocompute object project for me is just how easy it is to to generate it from a next flow pipeline using um the the, the plugin um, are there any projects ongoing to sort of like put similar functionality in other workflow managers? Um, so like a broader range of tools could be generating biocompute objects? Yeah. Uh, so, so far, um, DNA Nexus has a plugin for it. Um, seven, seven Bridges slash Velsera. So Velsera just bought Seven Bridges. Uh, Galaxy has a plugin, although with the latest update, I think that plugin uh, is no longer functional, it needs to be updated. Um, so, so that one needs to be fixed. Um, 
so those are the major ones. We we scoped out a uh, a presumptive CWL BCO kind of intermingling, and 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 we got uh, I think some really good examples out of that. One of the co-founders of CWL was was on our um, our standardization group, as a matter of fact. Um, we don't yet have any tools to do that automatically. Um, that said, you know I, I will say that the um, the seven bridges tool, I believe, is running primarily just on CWL. So that could probably be relatively easily adapted. They've got the current tool that's built into their platform, and then they've got an open access tool that's an R Shiny app, um, which is unfortunately that one was built on a, a pre-standardized version. It's the the 1.3 schema, um, but it shouldn't be too difficult to just bring that up to conformance with the current standard. Um, and you'd be able to see, you know, kind of nicely, I think, how it works with CWL. So that could also be an option. So, yeah, to answer your question, those those are the tools that currently exist. Okay. I don't see any other points or questions being raised at the moment. Some people already started leaving, so I think that's also um, fine. So I think then uh, we can close the meeting for today and i would really take uh take the minute to actually thank you both jonathan and diani who actually present today and also bring up uh, all of the interesting points about the bco uh, as said um, the recording will be shared within the nf core regulatory um uh, group um, i will also share the links with you via email so you will also get a, a quick uh, summary email and everything uh, sent over so that you can also reference that uh, thank you very much for being with us today here. And for those people who are going to the next next Flow Summit, um, we will have a regulatory dinner there as well with a special interest group around there. So Ken will be there. I will be there. I think multiple other people as well. So if you want to join there, then have a go in Barcelona. It's just about two weeks now. And uh, I hope to see you all there or at least some of you. Um, thanks again, Jonathan. I'll definitely be in touch. And I think uh, we'll also advertise this here within the company and with other folks who I know. Uh, thank you for being with us here and um, have a great rest of your day. Ours is about yes. to end, but yours is about to start. Right? So, <laughs> uh, thank you very much and uh, see you all soon in November. I think we'll have the next uh, regulatory special interest group meeting here. Thank okay, you. That's thank, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.